Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, Bland Sutton lecture this morning. Um, probably most of you know who Bland Sutton was, but for perhaps one or two who don't, uh, Sir John Bland Sutton was the first president of the association back in 1920, and for some time now we've been holding this uh, eponymous lecture. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our 2016 Bland Sutton lecture. Uh, this is someone I've known for quite a number of years. Uh, he was a consultant, general and vascular surgeon in Limerick, and also professor of surgery at the University of Limerick. Um, trained in Ireland, Britain, and the USA. And his first appointment was that of a consultant senior lecturer in the Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London. Uh, then following that, he moved to Limerick. Uh, he's a past council member of the association and the uh, British Journal of Surgery. Uh, he has written extensively. He's co-authored a very popular uh, surgical text called Surgery at a Glance, which I think is still in print for the fifth time. Um, he's published extensively on medical and Irish history. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Pierce Grace, who will deliver this year's Bland Sutton Lecture. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the President and the Council of the Association for inviting me to deliver the uh, Sir John Bland Sutton uh, lecture. <clears throat> this is a great honour uh, for me personally, uh, for Irish surgery, for Limerick and our fledgling uh, medical school. When asked to or invited to give this uh, lecture, you're allowed to pick your own topic. So having retired now from clinical surgery but continuing to uh, teach in the medical school, um, I thought after a lot of uh, consideration that I would talk about lifelong learning and my experiences with it, and I hope that you will find what I have to say interesting. <coughs> now, this is a, a play in five acts. So first of all, I'm going to say something about Sir John Bland Sutton, who was an interesting man. Then something about my education and learning, which are two different things. And then uh, surgical training, my own and uh, in general. Sir John Bland Sutton was born in 1855 in Enfield, uh, High, High Street in uh, North London. Um, <coughs> he uh, was um, two months premature when he was born. Uh, <coughs> he would, as John said, have a, an exciting and interesting uh, life and would become president of this uh, association. However, being two months uh, premature in 1855 wasn't a particularly good idea. Lady Bracknell comes to mind. Uh, to be one month premature in an era when infant perimortality was 155 per thousand deaths, births might seem um, foolish. To be two months uh, smacked of carelessness. Um, careless or not, he survived and prospered, but he did remain small in stature because of his prematurity. So he wrote later of himself uh, in a book that he uh, published in 1930 called The Story of a Surgeon. I remained at five foot seven inches, small in bone, short in limb, weak in muscle, and always ailing and easily duped. But I learned wisdom in the stern school uh, of experience. <clears throat> Initially, he thought he might uh, become a schoolmaster and progress to being a, a pupil teacher. But having watched his father dissect uh, animals, his father was an amateur naturalist and a taxidermist. Um, having seen that, he decided that he would become not a, a doctor, but a surgeon. <clears throat> so he said that he, having seen his father um, skin a partridge, he noticed a hole in the base of the skull, uh, which his father explained to him was the foramen um, uh, magnum. <clears throat> so he said that this was his first anatomy uh, lesson. And then later, 
his father explained that animals can survive without their spleens, and he said that this was his first lesson in uh, physiology. He would always retain this interest in um, uh, biology and zoology, and in 1881 he was appointed prosector and pathologist to the Zoological Society in uh, London. Um, it, this meant that when animals died, he would uh, dissect them uh, to try and find out what had happened. So in this way, he became very interested in anatomy and uh, embryology and something that he would retain um, all his life. So this is a very nice photograph of him uh, with uh, one of the uh, uh, chimps in the uh, zoo. <coughs> The two institutions with which uh, Sir John Bland Sutton was mostly associated were the Middlesex Hospital and the Royal College of Surgeons of England, whose president he would eventually become. He entered the Middlesex Hospital as a student in 1878 uh, and was appointed to the staff uh, as an assistant surgeon in 1886. So he's quite amusing about that appointment. <coughs> Apparently at the time there were more uh, surgeons than assistant surgeons in the hospital. Um, but they all wanted to go on holidays in August and September um, and nobody was left to mind the shop. And in those days, surgeons were powerful people and nobody could tell them that they couldn't do that. So the governors decided that they would appoint Bland Sutton as an assistant surgeon, but on the strict proviso that he stay in London during August and September. And this arrangement lasted for 19 years until eventually he became uh, or got a full appointment uh, in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> he retained his interest in anatomy throughout his career, and this is him here teaching uh, anatomy in the dissecting room in the Middlesex um, Hospital. In 1892, he was awarded the Jacksonian Prize uh, by the Royal College of Surgeons uh, of England uh, for uh, work he did on uh, ovaries and uh, fallopian uh, tubes and uh, this book which is hidden behind there uh, was a bestseller in its day and he became a very good pelvic surgeon with an interest in uh, gynecology but that wasn't his only interest um, he was also uh, <coughs> known to do uh, brain surgery draining uh, cerebral abscesses uh, and he had a special interest in gallbladder surgery and this is a little study he did in 1905 of the operations performed on the gallbladder in the chief hospitals of London uh, in that year. So you can see <coughs> that cholecystostomy had a mortality rate of 16% and cholecystectomy a mortality rate of 18%. And this is quite shocking to us, but some of those people died from um, tetanus, which they had acquired from the cat gut that was used uh, in the suture material. Cholecyst and andesis is an operation which I suspect most of you don't know what it is, but what they did was they opened the gallbladder, removed the stones, and then sewed up the gallbladder again. Um, so that operation didn't have much of a future, and they only did three of them. So given his interests in uh, surgery, um, <coughs> teaching, uh, travel, which he did a lot, uh, writing, these are some of the books that he, uh, he wrote, uh, and his interest in zoology and biology, we could agree with the spectator that he was a great uh, surgeon. And I think if we were to ask him today what he thought about lifelong learning, he would probably say that he agreed, and so do I. And so we could all go and have coffee now, but I think I better tell you something about my experience with um, lifelong uh, learning. So I've titled my talk, uh, Lifelong Learning in Odyssey. And the word Odyssey comes from Odysseus, who spent 10 years getting himself from uh, Troy back to uh, Ithaca, but he didn't take the uh, direct uh, route, as you can see. <coughs> so he only took 10 years to get from Troy to Ithaca. I had a very shorter journey to make uh, of 80 miles from Kilkenny to Limerick, uh, but it took me 40 years to get uh, uh, on my uh, odyssey. Um, but as you can see from the map, um, I went a uh, rather circuitous uh, route like um, Odysseus until eventually I ended up um, in Limerick. <coughs> now this is Joe Ito, <coughs> and Joe Ito is the chief executive of 
MIT Media uh, Labs. <coughs> MIT Media Labs is uh, part of the Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology, and its purpose is to take down the silos between the science, design, technology, art, and multimedia, and use the, uh, these various elements to tackle uh, problems. So things that they have looked at are digital approaches for treating neurological disease, stackable electric cars, which sounds interesting, and <coughs> something called technologies that can see around a corner. And there are lots and lots of other things that they do. Now, Joe Ito twice dropped out of formal uh, education, but still ended up in this very prestigious um, role. So he had some interesting things to say about the difference between education and learning. So he says that education is what other people uh, do to you, and learning is what you do uh, for yourself. So taking these uh, two titles, um, I'm going to look at my experience with education and um, learning. So first of all, my formal education started when I was the age of four, that's me, um, and I was sent to the <coughs> convent, to the Loreto nuns, and we used to sit in these little chairs, and we probably didn't learn very much, uh, but we learned to uh, socialize and realize that there was more to the world uh, than just us and our immediate uh, families. At the age of six, I was taken from the tender care of the nuns and sent to the brothers uh, to the local um, primary school. <coughs> so this, this was known uh, in Kilkenny as the Ballybuck Street Academy, but formerly St. John's National School. <coughs> Um, and it was run by the De La Salle uh, uh, brothers. Now, <coughs> Ireland has been uh, um, fortunate in having a primary school system of education since 1831. And <coughs> Gareth Fitzgerald, who was once uh, the uh, Prime Minister in the Republic, uh, wrote uh, a book on Irish primary education in the early 19th century. And like any thing that he wrote, it is full of statistics and uh, numbers. This is the cover of the book, and uh, the, the way the system worked was that the teacher had a number of monitors uh, under his care, and the monitors were the ones who did the actual teaching of the students. So the students uh, stood around with their toes to a line on the floor, um, standing around the monitor, and he taught them. And that's where the phrase, towing the line, comes from. Towing the line for us was an entirely different uh, matter. Um, at every hand's turn, we were uh, beaten with canes or straps or uh, drumsticks, and uh, one brother excelled himself with the uh, leg of a chair. Having survived this, I was sent, then sent to uh, Ring in uh, County Waterford, um, Ring <coughs> is like a boot camp for learning Irish, and uh, nowadays uh, teenagers will uh, go there for a couple of weeks in the summertime, and they have a great time. Uh, I was sent there at the tender age of 11 for a whole year, <coughs> and I can tell you, midwinter in uh, Waterford by the sea is more analogous to uh, cold it's than uh, a, summer, a summer camp. The big difference was few people escaped from cold, it's no one ever escaped from ring. At the risk of turning this talk into a Monty Python uh, sketch, um, <coughs> these are the four uh, Yorkshire men who are um, re reminiscing about their upbringing and how awful it was. I was then sent at the age of 12 to St. Kieran's College in Kilkenny. So this is St. Kieran's and architecturally it is uh, in the English perpendicular uh, style and is reminiscent of perhaps a Cambridge uh, college. But I can assure you there the similarity ends. We had a very limited uh, curriculum uh, based on the classics, Latin and Greek, and not a single modern language was uh, taught in the school. The only game that had any uh, <coughs> traction in the school was hurling. And as you all know, Kilkenny <coughs> still dominates hurling, as do the boys uh, of St. Cairns. <coughs> this was the timetable that we had uh, in 1965. 
So you will see uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we had classes um, in the morning. We had what was known as a half day on a Wednesday and a Saturday. <coughs> um, but the classes went on till two o'clock on the day that we had the half day. And every day, seven days a week, we had compulsory uh, study from 20 past five to seven and eight to 10. So anything that I ever had to do in life subsequently <coughs> was um, a doddle compared to this. <coughs> we also had this uh, uh, invention, which was known formally as the visitation, and we called the viz. And the senior academics of the um, school would come around every six weeks after our house exams or term exams and basically public humiliation would be dished out to those who didn't uh, perform as well as it was they th people thought they should have. So <coughs> the president would come, go through the list uh, of the pupils, uh, verbally berate whoever didn't do well, and then one of the deans would administer uh, corporal punishment in public in front of everybody um, to the um, erring student. Not very pleasant. <coughs> then I died and went to heaven and went to the medical school at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And as you know, our CSI is unique in having a medical school uh, among the surgical colleges. So here were a whole load of people who had an entirely different uh, background to myself. Nobody gave a fig whether we studied or we didn't study. <coughs> and uh, for the first time since I was in kindergarten, there were girls in the class, so it was wonderful. Um, and in spite of all these um, distractions, uh, we managed to uh, progress and qualify in uh, 1976. <coughs> I then uh, did surgery, and surgery at that time meant doing the primary uh, exam, and these are the actual papers that uh, I sat. <coughs> anatomy, physiology, applied physiology, and the principles of uh, pathology. Um, we would have had uh, vivas, uh, but no skills or anything like that. Um, two years later, we would have sat the final fellowship exam. Again, there were uh, papers and vivas, and this time clinics. And I did the clinics in this which, hospital, which is now closed, called the Royal City of Dublin Hospital. And I remember George Johnson of this uh, parish was one of my um, examiners asking me about the management of um, uh, pelvic Crohn's disease or perianal Crohn's uh, disease. Somehow or other I passed and if and that was the last uh, formal exam that I ever did in 1980 <clears throat> and had I chosen never to do another uh, thing um, uh, there was no statutory requirement for me uh, to do so. However I did do other things. I did a master's in uh, 1986, when I was a consultant in London, the English College very kindly made me a fellow at Aundham. I've always been uh, interested and, and written about uh, history, but I thought that I better put up or shut up, so I did an MA in history in 2012, and then when I was Chief Clinical Director, we did a Diploma in Leadership and Quality in Healthcare. And so that uh, brings to an end my formal education, or as uh, Joe Ito says, uh, the things that other people do to you. So learning is what you do for yourself, <coughs> and that's quite a different uh, story. So first of all, things that I learned in school, um, we used to sit in these little chairs, as I said, and there was a little hole in the arm, and one thing I learned was do not stick your finger into that hole because Mother Carmelita will not be exhibiting Christian charity as she yanks it back out, back out again. When we were in the national school and the canes were flying, the best thing to do is to shut up and keep your head um, down. In secondary school, because we had this glorious classical education, we realized that we knew things that uh, other people didn't know. So now, <coughs> this is actually a poem. It's an Irish poem, but it's written in Greek letters. And we did this, uh, we put this on the blackboard in, for one of our exams, uh, knowing that the likelihood was the exam would be invigilated by somebody who didn't know Greek. And the poem, Julie, came up on the exam paper, and we all duly wrote it off the blackboard, and we all duly did extremely well in the exam. And this is the poem. 
Queen of Kilcash, which uh, most uh, people of my generation will uh, know from their school days. <coughs> In medical school, we learned uh, uh, lots. We went from the R RCSI. This is the Richmond Hospital and its uh, residents. And we spent an awful lot of time in the hospital. Our teaching was uh, uh, bedside. Uh, <coughs> this is Professor Stephen Doyle, who was our uh, professor of medicine. Um, <coughs> and I think he's doing something that would have been very avant-garde in the 1970s, which is um, measuring esophageal uh, pressures. We did lots and lots of exams. So this is a forensic medicine exam, and one of my colleagues asked the examiners if they would mind if he took their photographs before he <laughs> they examined him, which they uh, kindly agreed to. Um, <coughs> when we weren't doing all that, we learned how to, to drink, to party, and then to, uh, to sleep it all off. So then, as I said, I went on and did uh, surgery, and surgery was an apprenticeship. So I'm like the apprentice here, operating on the uh, patient with the, uh, the nurse, and at the door is the consultant who is rapidly exiting stage left, saying, if you have any trouble, I'll be somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> through this apprenticeship uh, system, we learned an awful lot of surgery. So general surgery, orthopedics, plastics, urology, pediatrics and general and vascular, which is what I would end up uh, doing. So we also learned an awful lot of geography as we <coughs> went around the world. Now this may look like a lot to you, but this would not be unique uh, to me in terms of uh, trainees of my generation. Uh, most of us spent a lot of time in the United uh, Kingdom. Most of us went to uh, the United States uh, and this bit's probably unique in that I went backwards and forwards like a yo-yo between uh, Ireland and uh, Britain as I uh, trained, eventually becoming a consultant in uh, London first and then in um, uh, Britain. One of my more uh, observant uh, trainers said to me one day, the line between training and exploitation is very thin. And <coughs> Bland Sutton took 19 years to get his uh, full-time appointment and uh, he beat me by two years because I was 17 years going around this circuit before uh, finally landing in uh, Limerick. So then things that I learned as a consultant, and many of you will um, identify with these. This is Henry Marsh's great book, which I can highly recommend, uh, called uh, Do No Harm. Uh, so in his book, he describes um, delegating an operation to one of his uh, junior, uh, a laminectomy. And whatever happened, uh, the junior cut the uh, spinal nerves, uh, leaving the patient uh, paralyzed in that uh, limb. So delegation, and I've had n not that experience, but similar experiences in delegating things to people who I thought were well capable of doing uh, what I delegated, only to find they made a mess of it. So delegation is a really tricky business uh, and not that simple. But no matter what happens, you have to manage the team and the book stops with you. Um, so even though the trainee may have made a mess of the operation, you are uh, responsible. <coughs> the other thing you find out is you have to interact with uh, colleagues, uh, nurses, uh, and management. Most of the time you're training, you're dealing with people who are either superior or uh, inferior to you in terms of their uh, career, pa uh, career path. But now you have uh, colleagues on the same level, and uh, nurses and management who have a whole different um, uh, trajectory and you're wondering why why can't we just do something or other and then you realize that these people have a lot of different agendas which may be quite uh, different to what you want to do um, all I can say is what everybody says uh, dealing with the media and the lawyers keep good contemporaneous uh, records now in the Republic of Ireland whether you like it or not you're going to have to do private practice if you are um, a consultant uh, surgeon. 50% of the population has private health insurance, so 50% of the emergencies who come through the door will uh, be private patients. And A, they will expect to be treated uh, by <coughs> you, and B, the hospital and the system can't charge them unless you uh, bill them first. Um, so <coughs> you have to learn how to uh, to run a uh, private practice, which is a business, not a charity, so it has to be done um, uh, properly. <coughs> uh, you need to be organized. You need to, people need to know how to be organized and use technology. 
one of the great things that I worked out for myself was a system whereby if I saw a patient in consultation and we decided that they needed to have an operation, then I would give them the date for the operation when I saw them. And remarkably, that worked uh, very well. The technology I used was a diary. Um, um, and you can, it started with paper and ended with electronic. Uh, but it did work uh, very well. And people were very happy to know that they were going to have their operation on a particular day. Uh, you need to uh, keep up. And the best way to keep up is, I think, uh, to write a paper or a book about something, because then you'll have to know about it. Um, and uh, John uh, referred to that when he was introducing me. And lastly, you need to learn how to look after yourself. And John jokingly said at the beginning, you don't miss the call. And I certainly don't miss the call. Uh, and I really do think that as people get older, uh, call uh, is uh, literally a killer. <coughs> So, in my new life, I have new learning, so I had to go back and learn all my anatomy and physiology because I had to teach it. Uh, so that was quite an, an interesting um, uh, adventure, and anatomy and physiology has moved on quite a lot since I did it 40 years ago. Um, I was also, I've also uh, exploited my history um, knowledge. I wrote this book on, uh, lo on the local history, and I've done some artwork. I designed the logo for our hospital, and this is a cover of a book that one of my colleagues uh, produced, and I did the drawing uh, for him. <coughs> so now, uh, just to go back to my uh, surgical training a bit, this is Harold Brown, who was uh, one of the doyens of uh, Irish surgery. And uh, he used to say, uh, young surgeons have fire in their bellies, ambition in their heads, and lack of experience in their boots. And that fairly summed us up. But the philosophy when we started was see one, do one, uh, teach one. Um, we did lots of uh, exams and we were tested uh, in knowledge uh, quite extensively, both uh, written and uh, verbal. But even though we were training to be surgeons, which is a skill-based uh, operation, there was no formal assessment of skills or competencies in the uh, system. Um, <clears throat> now, we did train in hospitals and people were observing us, but there was still no formal uh, way to uh, assess the skills and competencies. And it's interesting that as far back as 1765, uh, Sylvester O'Halloran, who was a, a Limerick surgeon but trained in France uh, and was very interested in or very impressed with the French uh, system, uh, advocated that A, there be a college uh, in Ireland and that the college would have exams. And that the exam would be three days. And on the third day, uh, the third to finish, with performing all the operations of surgery on a body with their apparatus and uh, bandages. So as far as the middle of the 18th century, people were advocating uh, skills-based uh, competencies uh, for uh, surgery. He also suggested that it would be free to Irishmen um, uh, Irish only, but needless to say, the uh, RCSI didn't, didn't look kindly on that suggestion either. Okay, now you think I'm gone bonkers now, but here's uh, surgery and the Irish question. This is William uh, Ewart Gladstone, who spent most of his life uh, thinking and worrying about Ireland and what he called the Irish question. And historians will say that uh, as soon as he got close to the answer, somebody changed the question. And uh, surgery is a bit like that, and uh, just a few examples will uh, make the point. Uh, so this is... Uh, F.X. O'Connell, who was a, another great uh, Dublin surgeon, um, and he really was a terrific uh, surgeon. <clears throat> his uh, anaesthetist, can you imagine any of us saying his anaesthetist nowadays, used to say, if we can't do it, it can't be done. Uh, and while it was said jokingly, there was a, a fair amount of truth uh, in it. So one day at a conference, um, the physicians put up a IV cholangiogram like this, and it showed some stones at the end of the bile duct. So FX said to me, Piercy, put her on the list and we will remove the stones tomorrow. And the gastroenterologist John Lennon said, no need, and he rattled the stones in a jar under FX's nose, and FX was shocked. He had done an ERCP, removed the stones, and so overnight, this operation that he absolutely loved doing and was very good at was suddenly not relevant anymore. 
are rarely uh, relevant. And uh, all of us now uh, know that an expiration of the bile duct is not a very common uh, thing in our hospitals. His colleague, uh, Sean Heffernan, was <coughs> Mr. Highly Selective Phlegotomy in Ireland. And in 1985, he uh, produced uh, a paper in the Annals of Surgery, a 12-year review of 500 highly selective uh, vagotomies. And his conclusion towards the end of the paper was that because of the widespread use of simethidine, the numbers of these operations were beginning to fall. And if they fell, we wouldn't be able to train surgeons to do this operation anymore. 1985 was a significant year because that very year, um, uh, Marshall and Warren uh, published their paper uh, which ended showing that uh, H. pylori uh, was the cause of peptic ulcer and overnight highly selective vagotomy just disappeared. These are some of the things that I was involved with myself where the, somebody changed the question. <coughs> Renal lithotripsy was introduced by the late John Fitzpatrick um, into the Mater Hospital in Dublin in 1989 and again overnight uh, open up surgery for uh, stones um, was, it didn't disappear but was reduced uh, greatly. David Boucher Hayes you would uh, <coughs> all know of uh, and uh, we were to the fore in the laparoscopic uh, revolution that happened around uh, 1990 and then later on uh, in vascular surgery I was peripherally involved uh, with some of that but endovascular repair has now totally transformed um, aneurysm uh, surgery. And <coughs> all of you gastrointestinal surgeons who think that there will be plenty of work because we'll have cancer to do <coughs> uh, should take note uh, of this um, uh, report uh, from gastrointestinal cancer symposiums. But first of all, the incidence seems to be decreasing. And uh, this man, Philip Patey from Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, has shown that carefully selected patients with low rectal cancers um, whose tumors disappear after chemo radiation um, can be followed with the watch and wait surveillance. So many people can be cured without surgery. I think poor old FX would turn in his grave if he heard that. So how do we train surgeons in Ireland uh, now? So Oscar Trainer is here in the audience and uh, he is one of the architects of this uh, system. So the idea is that it will be comprehensive, streamlined, streamlined and uh, balanced. Because of the difficulties of the working time directive, the um, <coughs> apprentice system that went on for years and years that we went through, or I went through anyway, um, is no longer tenable. And so you have to provide uh, technology enhanced uh, uh, learning and simulation of uh, technical and non-technical skills. So the idea is that we still have interns in the, in the Republic um, and after internship people will join the uh, surgical training program and then it will be a run through program which will uh, last for eight years. After two years you will have finished uh, core surgical training, you will be expected to have uh, got your MRCS exam and then you progress to higher specialty training on the basis of competitive ranking, performance metrics, human factors and a specialty interview and you get a certificate to say that you have completed this stage. And then higher training, um, again, the uh, Irish College uses the NOT system that was pioneered by the University of Aberdeen and the Scottish uh, College, um, and people would end up doing the FRCS uh, specialty um, exam. Now, sociologists like to divide the generations up into different um, uh, names and categories. So people like uh, me were at the end of the baby boomer uh, generation and people who are uh, finishing their surgical training now are the millennial uh, surgeons or generation um, Y. <coughs> so there is a difference between what we were and what they will be. So we were predominantly male, uh, generally lone practitioners, uh, top dog. Top dog is not a, a, a great uh, system. There were some dreadful scandals in the uh, Republic of uh, people doing bad uh, operations um, and because they were uh, on their own in an isolated unit, uh, nobody said uh, boo uh, until it was uh, uh, too late. <coughs> so now people are just as likely to be male or female, uh, more like a husky and members of a team 
uh, than a top, gov, top dog. We were very experienced in a wide range of surgery, and many of us were generalists with a special interest in something or other. But there were a few problems that came along that we couldn't uh, make a good uh, um, uh, fist of. Now, <coughs> people are trained in very well trained, but in a narrow range of surgery and are specialists. And this is fine, but it does raise, and this has been the subject of many um, lectures from uh, rostrums like this, how do you deal with emergency uh, general surgery if, if everybody's a specialist? Uh, <coughs> we had an apprenticeship system, long hours of training and endless work. Now, because of European Working Time Directive, we have run through training, streamlined, and the millennial surgeons see that they have a life beyond surgery and are not interested in just working all the hours and days that uh, are there. Our system was very knowledge-based, as I have uh, said, and uh, people used to have strong opinions and uh, tradition uh, carried a lot of uh, weight. Uh, now, it's evidence-based uh, knowledge, skills, and uh, competencies. As I said, people were autonomous, that's not good. Now people are accountable here in the UK to the Care Quality Commission and in the Republic to um, HICWA. We haven't got to the stage yet of putting people's mortality online, but I'm sure that will happen. Um, <coughs> it was thought that you could uh, have finite knowledge and skills, like you could learn how to do a highly selective agotomy and then they wouldn't have to know any more about um, uh, ulcer uh, surgery but it keeps changing and it's essential that you uh, f keep up and uh, track the changes. I did hear a consultant once say, I am the consultant I know. Um, you think he was Louis XIV. Um, but <coughs> the only answer is what Cromwell said to the Church of Scotland, think it possible, gentlemen, you might be mistaken. Um, it was paternalistic, now there's, uh, it is informative. Um, people were uh, very proud um, that they would be able to do any operation. Uh, so you might find somebody who normally did um, hernias and gallbladders and whatever, and then suddenly they do an aneurysm or a whipple, um, and <coughs> they didn't see, see anything wrong uh, with that. Uh, because people are now specialist uh, uh, trained, there will be a need for them as consultants to collaborate uh, with their colleagues for different difficult cases. And we did this in Limerick in relation to aneurysm surgery. Once the EVARs had come and the easy, inverted commas, aneurysms were removed, the only ones that we were doing open were really difficult. So we made it a policy that we would always have two consultant uh, vascular surgeons present for an open aneurysm. And <coughs> anecdotally, that produced better results, but for sure it reduced the stress on the people um, operating uh, on, the, on the patients. And this is this uh, joke that physicians say about surgeons and surgeons say about orthopedic surgeons. He won't know what to do either, but he'll do something. Um, so sometimes it's best to do uh, nothing. Um, and we all uh, appreciate that. So my advice to a budding surgeon, uh, learning is um, as important as education. Uh, skills are as valuable as knowledge. And the world is changing all of the time. Be curious and be adaptable. Be compassionate. For most patients, they don't choose to be uh, sick. You need to take time to reflect, uh, time out to think about what you're doing and what's going on, and you need to look after yourself. And I like this quotation from T.S. Eliot, which he wrote just over 100 years ago. And time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. And I think that sums up surgery very nicely. Um, it is all the works and days of hands, and there will be lots and lots of questions that are dropped on your plate. And often there won't be a clear answer as to what the, uh, to the question. And so there will be time yet for a hundred indecisions and yet a hundred visions uh, and revisions. And then I'd like to leave the last word to uh, Jack Kyle. Um, <coughs> Jack Kyle was uh, an Ulster man, uh, an Irish man, a citizen of the United Kingdom, a surgeon, a Christian missionary, and most of all, a rugby player. And he had no difficulty in inhabiting all of these worlds um, uh, very well. So he played for Ulster, um, Ireland, and uh, the Lions. Uh, so he said, <coughs> remember the past with kindness, live the present with enthusiasm, 
and look to the future with confidence. And I would add, uh, never stop uh, learning. Thank you for your attention.